Chapter 6 of Stand By for Mars. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sean O'Hara. Stand By for Mars by Kerry Rockwell. Chapter 6. Well, Steve, how's everything going? Captain Steve Strong didn't answer right away. He returned the salute of a space cadet passing on the opposite slidewalk, and then faced Commander Walters, who stood beside him, eyeing him quizzically. Things are shaping up pretty well, Commander. He replied finally, with an air of unconcern. The Earthworm Cadets buckling down to business. Commander Walter's voice matched Strong's nonchalance. Yes, I'd say so, sir. Speaking generally, of course. Strong felt the back of his neck begin to flush as Commander Walters kept eyeing him. And speaking specifically, Steve? Why, uh, what do you mean, sir? Let's stop fencing with each other, Steve. Commander Walters spoke kindly, but firmly. What about Manning and Unit 42D? Are those boys learning to work together or not? And I want facts, not hopes. Strong hesitated, trying to word his reply. In these weeks that had followed Tom's fight with Roger in the gym, there had been no further incidents of open warfare. Roger's attitude, once openly defined, had now subsided into a stream of never-ending sarcasm. The sting had been taken out of his attack, and he seemed satisfied merely to annoy. Astra had withdrawn into a shell, refusing to allow Roger to bother him, and only an occasional rumble of anger indicated his true feelings towards the troublesome unit mate. Tom maintained his role of peacemaker, and daily, in many ways, showed his capacity for leadership by stirring his unit mates away from storm-provoking activities. Strong finally broke the silence. It's difficult to answer that question with facts, Commander Walters. Why? insisted Walters. Well, nothing's really happened, answered Steve. You mean nothing since that fight in the gym? Oh, Strong flushed. You know about that. Commander Walters smiled. Black eyes and faces that look like raw beef don't go on notice, Steve. Uh, no sir, was Strong's lame reply. What I want to know is, pursued Walters, did the fight prove anything? Did the boys get it out of their systems, and are they concentrating on becoming a unit? Right now, Commander, they're concentrating on passing their manuals. They realize that they have to work together to get through this series of tests. Why, Dr. Dale told me the other day that she's sure Tom's been giving Roger a few pointers on control deck operation, and one night I found Manning giving Astro a lecture in compression ratios. Of course, Manning's way of talking is a way that would confuse the Venusian more than it would help him, but at least they weren't snarling at each other. Hmm, Walters nodded. Sounds hopeful, but still not conclusive. After all, they have to help each other in the manuals. If one member of the unit fails, it will reflect on the marks of the other two, and they might be washed out too. Even the deadliest enemies will unite to save their lives. Perhaps, sir, replied Strong, but we're not dealing with deadly enemies now. These are three boys with three distinct personalities who've been lumped together in strange surroundings. It takes time and patience to make a team that will last for years. You may have patience, Steve, but the Academy hasn't the time. Commander Walters was suddenly curt. When does Unit 42D take its manuals? This afternoon, sir, replied Strong. I'm on my way over to the examination hall right now. Very well. I won't take any action yet. I'll wait for the results of the test. Perhaps they will solve both of our problems. See you later, Steve. Turning abruptly, Commander Walters stepped off the sidewalk onto the steps of the administration building and rapidly disappeared from view. Left alone, Strong pondered the commander's parting statement. The implications were clear. If the unit failed to make a grade high enough to warrant the trouble it took keeping it together, it would have to be broken up, or even worse, one or more of the boys would be dismissed from the academy. A few minutes later, Strong arrived in the examination hall, a large, barren room with a small door in each of the three walls other than one containing the entrance. Tom Corbett was waiting in the center of the hall and saluted smartly as Strong approached. Cadet Corbett, reporting for manual examination, sir. Stand easy, Corbett, replied Strong, returning the salute. This is going to be a rough one. Are you fully prepared? I believe so, sir. Tom's voice wasn't too steady. A fleeting smile passed over Strong's lips, and he continued. You'll take the control deck examination first. Manning will be next on the radar bridge, and Astro last on the power deck. They'll be here according to schedule, sir. Very well. Follow me. Strong walked quickly to the small door in the left wall, Tom staying a respectful step behind. When he reached the door, the officer pressed a button in the wall beside it, and the door slid open. All right, Corbett. Inside. Strong nodded towards the interior of the room. The boy stepped in quickly, then stopped in amazement. All around him was a maze of instruments and controls, and in the center, twin pilot's chairs. Captain Strong! 
Tom was so surprised that he could hardly get the words out. It's... it's a real control deck. Strong smiled. As real as you could make it, Corbett, without allowing the building to blast off. He gestured towards the pilot's chairs. Take your place and strap in. Yes, sir! His eyes still wide with wonder, Tom stepped over to the indicated chair and Strong followed him, leaning casually against the other. He watched the young cadet nervously adjust his seat strap and put a comforting hand on his shoulder. Nervous, Corbett? Yes, sir. Just a little, replied Tom. Don't worry, said Strong. You should have seen the way I came into this room fifteen years ago. My cadet officer had dragged me into the control pilot's seat. Tom managed a fleeting smile. Now, Corbett, Strong's voice became businesslike. As you know, these manual tests are the last tests before actually blasting off. In the past weeks, you cadets have been subjected to every possible examination to discover any flaw in your work that might later crop up in space. This manual operations test of the control board, like Manning's on the radar bridge and Astro's on the power deck, is designed to test you under simulated space conditions. If you pass this test, your next step will be real space. Yes, sir. I warn you, it isn't easy, and if you fail, you personally will wash out, and if the other members of the unit do not get a high enough mark to average out a passing grade for all of you, you fail as a unit. I understand, sir, said Tom. All right, then we'll begin. Your crew is aboard, the airlock is closed. What's the first thing you do? Adjust the air circulating system to ensure standard Earth conditions. How do you do that? By pressing this button, which will activate the servo units. They automatically keep the circulating pumps in operation, based on thermostatic readings from the main gauge. Tom pointed to a black clock face with a luminous white hand and numbers. All right, carry on, said Strong. Tom reached over for the huge control board that extended around him for some two feet on three sides. He placed a nervous finger on a small button, waited for the gauge below to register with a swing of the hand, and then released it. All pressure steady, sir. What next? Check the crew, sir, all departments, replied Tom. Carry on, said Strong. Tom reached out and pulled a microphone towards him. All hands, station check, said Tom, and then was startled to hear a metallic voice answer him. Power deck ready for lap off. And then another voice. Radar deck ready for lap off. Tom leaned back in the pilot's seat and turned to the captain. All stations ready, sir. Good. What next? Asked Strong. Ask Spaceport Tower for blast-off clearance. Strong nodded. Tom turned back to the microphone and, without looking, punched a button in front of him. Rocket Cruiser! He paused and turned back to Strong. What name do I give, sir? Strong smiled. Nose Arc. Rocket Cruiser Nose Arc to Spaceport Control. Request blast-off clearance in orbit. Once again, a thin, metallic voice answered and gave the necessary instructions. On and on, through every possible command, condition, or decision that would be placed in front of him, Tom guided his imaginary ship on its imaginary flight through space. For two hours, he pushed buttons, snapped switches, and jockeyed controls. He gave orders and received them from the thin, metallic voices. They answered him with such accuracy, and sometimes with seeming hesitation, that Tom found it difficult to believe that they were only electronically controlled recording devices. Once, when supposedly blasting through space at three-quarters space speed, he received a warning from the radar bridge of an approaching asteroid. He asked for a course change, but in reply only received static. Believing the recording to have broken down, he turned inquiringly to Captain Strong, but received only a blank stare in return. Tom hesitated for a split second, then turned back to the controls. He quickly flipped the teleceiver button on and began plotting the course of the approaching asteroid, ignoring for the moment his other duties on the control deck. When he'd finished, he gave the course shift to the power deck and ordered a blast at the starboard jet. He waited for the course change, saw it register on the gauges in front of him, then continued his work. Strong suddenly leaned over and clapped him on the back enthusiastically. Good work, Corbett. That broken recording was put there to intentionally trap you. Not one cadet in twenty would have had the presence of mind you showed in plotting the course of that asteroid yourself. Thank you, sir, stammered Tom. That's all. The test is over. Return to your quarters. He came over and laid a hand on Tom's shoulder. And don't worry, Corbett. While it isn't customary to tell a cadet, I think you deserve it. You've passed with a perfect score. I have, sir? You mean, I really passed? Next step is Manning, said Strong. You've done about as much as one cadet can do. Thank you, sir. Tom could only repeat it over and over. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dazed, he saluted his superior and turned to the door. Two hours in the pilot's chair had made him dizzy, but he was happy. Five minutes later, he slammed back the sliding door and entered the quarters of 42D with a lusty shout. Meet Space Cadet Corbett, and Earthworm has just passed his Control Deck Manual Operations exam. Astro looked up from Book of Tables on Astrogation and gave Tom a wan smile. Congratulations, Tom, he said and turned back to his book. 
adding bitterly, that I don't get these tables down by this afternoon for my power deck manual. You're sunk. Say, what's going on here? asked Tom. Where's Roger? Didn't he help you with him? He left. Said he had to see someone before taking his radar bridge manual. He helped me a little, but when I asked him a question, he'd just rattle off the answer so fast. Well, I just couldn't follow him. Suddenly slamming the book shut, he got up. Me and these tables, he indicated the book, just don't mix. What's the trouble? Uh, I can get the easy ones about astrogation. They're simple, but it's the ones where I have to combine it with the power deck. Well, I mean, what specifically? asked Tom softly. For instance, I've got to find the ratio for compression of the main firing tubes, using a given amount of fuel, heading for a given destination, and taking a given amount of time for passage. But that's control deck operations as well as astrogation and power, exclaimed Tom. Yeah, I know, answered Astro, but I've still got to be able to do it. If anything happened to you two guys and I didn't know how to get you home, then what? Tom hesitated. Astro was right. Each member of the unit had to depend on the others in any emergency, and if one of them failed, Tom saw why the ground manuals are so important now. Look, offered Tom, suppose we go over the whole thing again together. Maybe you're followed up on the basic concept. Tom grabbed a chair, hitched it close to the desk, and pulled Astro down beside him. He opened the book and began studying the problem. Now look, you have 22 tons of fuel, and considering the position of your ship in space. As the two boys, their shoulders hunched over the table, began reviewing the table of ratios, Across the quadrangle in the examination hall, Roger Manning stood in a replica of rocket ship's radar bridge and faced Captain Strong. Cadet Manning reporting for manual examination, sir. Roger brought up his arm in a crisp salute to Captain Strong, who returned it casually. Stand easy, Manning, replied Strong. Do you recognize this room? Yes, sir. It's a mock-up of radar bridge. A workable mock-up, cadet. Strong was vaguely irritated by Roger's nonchalance in accepting the situation that Tom had marveled at. You will take your manuals here. Yes, sir. On these tests, you will be timed for both efficiency and speed, and you'll use all the tables, charts, and astrogation equipment that you'd find on a spaceship. Your problems are purely mathematical. There are no decisions to make. Just use your head. Strong handed Roger several sheets of paper containing written problems. Roger shuffled them around in his fingers, giving each a quick glance. You may begin any time you're ready, Manning, said Strong. I'm ready now, sir, replied Roger calmly. He turned to the swivel chair located between the huge communications board, the adjustable chart table, and the astrogation prism. Directly in front of him was a huge radar scanner, and to one side and overhead was a tube mounted on a swivel joint that looked like a small telescope, but which was actually an astrogation prism for taking sights on celestial bodies in space. Roger concentrated on the first problem. You are now in the northwest quadrant of Mars, Chart M, Area 28. You have been notified by the control deck that it has been necessary to jettison three quarters of your fuel supply. For the last 579 seconds, you have been blasting at one quarter space speed. The four main drive rockets were cut at 30 second intervals. Making adjustments for degree of slip from each successive rocket cutout. Find present position by using crossfix with Regulus as a starboard fix, Alpha Centauri as your port fix. Suddenly a bell began to ring in front of Roger. Without hesitation, he adjusted the dial that brought the radar scanner into focus. When the screen remained blank, he made a second adjustment, and then a third and a fourth, until the bright white flash of a meter was seen on the scanner. He quickly grabbed two knobs, one in each hand, and twisted them to move two thin plotting lines, one horizontal and one vertical, across the surface of the scanner. Setting the vertical line, he fingered the tabulating machine with his right hand, as he adjusted the second line with his left, thus cross-fixing the meteor. Then he turned his whole attention to the tabulator, ripped off the answer with lightning moves of his fingers, and began talking rapidly into the microphone. Radar bridge control deck, alien body bearing 015, 1 1.7 degrees over plane of the ecliptic, on intersecting orbit. Change course 2 degrees, hold for 15 seconds and resume our original heading, will compensate for change nearer destination. Roger watched the scanner a moment longer. When the rumbling blast of the steering jet sounded in the chamber, and the meteor flash shifted on the scanner screen, he returned the problem in his hand. Seven minutes later, he turned to Strong and handed him the answer. Present position by dead reckoning is Northwest Quadrant of Mars, Chart O, Area 39, sir, he answered confidently. Strong tried to mask his surprise, but a lifted eyebrow gave him away. And how did you arrive at that conclusion, Manning? I was unable to get a sight on Alpha Centauri due to the present position of Jupiter, sir replied Roger easily. So I took a fix on Earth, allowed for its rotational speed around the Sun, and took the cross-fix with Regulus as ordered in the problem. Of course, I included all the other factors of the speed and heading of our ship. That was routine. 
Strong accepted the answer with a curt nod, motioning for Roger to continue. It would not do, thought Strong, to let Manning know that he was the first cadet in 39 years to make the correct selection of Earth in working up the fix with Regulus, and still have the presence of mind to plot a meteor without so much as half-degree error. Of course, the problem varied with each cadet, but it remained essentially the same. Seven and a half minutes. Commander Walters would be surprised, to say the least, thought Steve. Forty-five minutes later, Roger, as unruffled as if he'd been sitting listening to a lecture from a sound slide, handed in the rest of his papers, executed a sharp salute, and walked out. Two down and one to go, thought Strong, and the toughest one of them all coming up, Astro. The big Venusian was unable to understand anything that couldn't be turned with a wrench. The only thing to prevent Unit 42D from taking Academy Unit Honors over Unit 77K, the unit assigned to Lieutenant Volchek, would be Astro. While none of the members of the other units could come up to the individual brilliance of Corbett or Manning, they worked together as a unit, helping one another. They might make a higher unit rating simply because they were better balanced. He shrugged his shoulders and collected the papers. It was as much torture for him as it was for any cadet, he thought, and turned to the door. All right, Astro, he said to himself. In ten minutes it'll be your turn, and I'm going to make it tough. Back in the quarters of Unit 42D, Tom and Astro still pored over the books and papers on the desk. Let's try it again, Astro, sighed Tom as he hitched his chair closer to the desk. You've got thirty tons of fuel. You want to find the compression ratio on the number one firing tube chamber. So what do you do? Start up the auxiliary, burn a little of the stuff, and judge what it'll be, the big cadet replied. That's the way I did it on the space freighters. But you're not on a space freighter now, exclaimed Tom. You've got to do things the way they want it done here at the Academy. By the book. These tables have been figured out by great minds to help you, and you just want to burn a little of the stuff and guess what it'll be. Tom threw up his hands in disgust. Seems to me I heard an old saying back in the teen centuries about leading a horse to water but not being able to make him drink, drawled Roger from the doorway. He strolled in and kicked at the crumpled sheets of paper that littered the floor, stark evidence of Tom's efforts with Astro. All right, wise guy, said Tom. Suppose you explain it to him. No can do, replied Roger. I tried. I explained it to him twenty times this morning while you were taking your control deck manual. He tapped his head delicately with his forefinger. Can't get through. Too thick. Astro turned to the window to hide the mist in his eyes. Lay off, Roger, snapped Tom. He got up and walked over to the big cadet. Come on, Astro. We haven't got much time. You're due in the examination hall in a few minutes. It's no good, Tom. I just can't understand that stuff. Astro turned and faced his unit mates, his voice charged with sudden emotion. Just fifteen minutes on the power deck of anything with rockets in her, and I'll run her from here to the next galaxy. I... I can't explain it. When I look at those motors, I can read them like you read an astrogation chart, Roger. Or you the gauges on the control deck, Tom. But I just can't get those ratios out of a book. I gotta put my hands on those motors. Touch them. I mean, really touch them. Then I know what to do. As suddenly as he started, he stopped and turned, leaving Tom and Roger staring at him, startled by this unusual outburst. Cadets, stand to! roared a voice from the doorway. The three cadets snapped to attention and faced the entrance. Take it easy, earthworms, said Tony Richards. A tall cadet with closely cut black hair and a lazy, smiling face stood in the doorway. Lay off, Richards, said Tom. We haven't time for gags now. Astor's going to take his power deck manual in a few minutes, and we're cramming with him. Okay, okay, don't blow your jets, said Richards. I just wanted to see if there are any bets in which unit would cop honors in the manuals this afternoon. I suppose you think your unit 47K will finish on top, drawled Roger. I'd like to put all the galley demerits we have in 77K against yours. With Astro on our team, complained Roger. What's the matter with Astro, asked Richards. From what I hear, he's hot stuff. It wasn't a compliment, but a sharp dig made with a sly smile. Astro balled his huge hands into fists. Astro, said Roger, is tight that can smell out trouble on any power deck, but today he came down with a cold. No, I'm afraid no bet, Richards. I'll give you two to one, Richards offered. Nothing doing, not even at five to one, not with Astro. Richards grinned, nodded, and disappeared. Roger turned to face the hard stare of Tom. That was the dirtiest sellout I've ever seen, Manning, Tom growled. Sorry, Corbett, said Roger. I only bet on sure things. That's okay with me, Manning, said Astro. But I'm afraid you sold yourself a hot rocket, so I'm going to pass. <laughs> Who are you kidding? 
Roger laughed and sprawled on his bunk. Astro took a quick step forward, his fist clenched, his face a mask of burning anger. But Tom quickly jumped in front of him. You'll be late for the exam, Astro, he shouted. Get going or it'll count against your mark. Heh, <laughs> that's a few more points more or less when you're going to fail anyway, snorted Roger from the bunk. Again, Astro started to lunge forward and Tom braced himself against the Venusian's charge. But suddenly the burly cadet stopped. Disengaging Tom's restraining arms, he spoke coldly to the sneering boy on the bed. I'm going to pass the exam, Manning. Get that? I'm going to pass and then come back here and beat your head off. Turning on his heel, he stalked out of the room. Tom immediately wheeled to face Roger, fire in his eyes, and the arrogant cadet, sensing trouble, jumped to his feet to meet him. What's the idea of giving Astro a hard time? demanded Tom. Cool off, Corbat, replied Roger warily. You're fusing your tubes, you're so hot. You bet I'm hot. Hot enough to blast you. Again. Tom deliberately spat out the last word. Roger flushed and brought his fists up quickly as though to charge in, then suddenly dropped them again. He turned to the door slowly and walked out. Go blow your jets. His voice drifted back to Tom as he disappeared. Tom stood there, looking at the empty door, almost blind with rage and frustration. He was failing in the main job assigned to him, that of keeping the unit on an even keel and working together. How could he command a crew out in space if he couldn't keep the friction of his own unit under control? Slowly, he left the room to wait for Astro in the recreation hall, where the results of the manuals would be announced. He thought of Astro, now probably deep in his exam, and wondered how bad it would be for him. Then another thought crossed his mind. Roger had said nothing of his own test, and neither he nor Astro had thought to inquire. He shook his head. No matter where the unit placed in the manuals, it just couldn't stay together. End of Chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Stand By for Mars This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sean O'Hara Stand By for Mars by Carrie Rockwell Chapter 7 It was customary for all Earthworm cadets to gather in the main recreation hall to wait the results of the manuals, which would be announced on the huge teleceiver screen. Since all the units were taking their tests this afternoon, the hall was crowded with green-clad cadets, talking in low murmurs and waiting tensely for the outcome of the exam. Tom entered the huge room, looked around, and then drifted toward Al Dixon, the senior cadet who had greeted them as a unit after passing classification tests. The blue-clad cadet was listening to a story spool, a device that told a story rather than let the person read it from a book. Hey, Corbett, said Dixon, smiling. Drag up a chair. Listening to a terrific yarn about the guy stranded on an asteroid, and then he finds... The red-headed cadet's voice trailed off when he noticed that Tom wasn't listening. Say, what's the matter with you? You look like you just lost your best friend. Not yet, but it won't be long now, commented Tom, a trace of bitterness creeping into his voice. Astro's taking his power deck manual. What he knows about those compression ratios just isn't known, but he just can't get it down on paper. Don't sell your unit mate short, said Dixon, sensing something beneath Tom's comment. I've heard that big fellow knows more about a rocket deck than McKinney. Yeah, that's true, said Tom, but... You know, Corbett, said Dixon, switching off the story spool, there's something screwy in that outfit of yours. You can say that again, agreed Tom bitterly. You come in here with a face dragging on the floor and manning, Tom's head jerked up. Manning? What about that space-gassing hot shot? Manning just tore through the wreck hall trying to get some of the other Earthroom units to bet their galley demerits against your outfit. Tom's mouth sagged open. You mean he actually wanted to bet that Astro would pass? Not just pass, Corbett. He wanted to bet that your unit would be the top rocket of the Earthworms. The head of the list. But he told Astro that... He stopped. Told him what? Uh, nothing, said Tom. He jumped up and headed for the door. Hey, where are you going? To find Manning. There are a couple things I want to clear up. Tom left Dixon shaking his head in bewilderment and jumped on the slide stairs. He was going to have it out with Roger once and for all. Hopping off the slide stairs onto the 42nd floor, he started down the long hall to his quarters. Nearing the door, he heard Roger's laugh and then his lazy voice talking to someone inside. Sure, they're dumb, but they're not bad guys, said Roger. Tom walked into the room. Roger was sitting on the side of his bunk facing Tony Richards. Hey, Corbett, said Roger. Did you hear how Astro made out yet? Tom ignored the question. I want to talk to you, Roger. Roger eyed him suspiciously. Sure, Corbett, go right ahead. Well, I'll be going along, said Richards. He had heard about the previous fight between Manning and Corbett, and didn't want to be hauled up as a witness if they started again. Remember, Manning, he called from the doorway, the bet is two to one, and are you going to get tired of washing pots and pans? He waved his hand at Corbett and disappeared. All right, Corbett, Roger turned to Tom. 
What's frying you? I just saw Al Dixon down in the rec hall, answered Tom. He told me you were looking for bets on the unit ratings. Is that why Richards was here? That's right. What made you say those things to Astro before he went to his manual? Very simple. I wanted to make him pass, and that was the only way. You're pretty sure of yourself, Roger. I'm always sure of myself, Corbett. And the sooner you learn that, the easier it'll be for all of us. I never bet unless it's in the bag. I know Astro's going to pass. Some guys have to have a fire built under them before they get moving. Astro's one of them. That doesn't answer my question, said Tom. Why did you say the things you did before a guy goes to an exam? I said what I did to make Tony Richards give me odds, and to make Astro mad enough to pass. We're a cinch to win, and Richards' outfit will be indebted to us for a year's worth of galley demerits. He smiled easily. Smooth, huh? I think it's rotten, said Tom. Astro left here feeling like a plugged credit. And if he does fail, it'll be because you made him think he was the dumbest guy in the universe. Eh, he probably is, mused Roger. But he still won't fail that manual. From the hallway behind them, a loud blasting yell was suddenly heard, echoing from somewhere in the lower floors. Tom and Roger waited, their eyes wide and hopeful. There is only one person at Space Academy capable of making that noise. He made it, Tom exclaimed. Of course he made it, said Roger casually. Astro tore into 42D in a mad rush. No! He grabbed the two cadets and picked them up, one in each hand. I made it. Hands down, I handled those rocket motors like they were babes in arms. I told you that all I had to do was touch them and I'd know. I told you. Congratulations, Astro, said Tom with a wide grin. I knew you'd do it. Put me down, you oversized Venusian jerk, said Roger almost good-naturedly. Astro released a smaller cadet and faced him. Well, Hotshot, I promised you something when I got back, didn't I? Make it later, will ya? And I'll be glad to oblige. He walked towards the door. I've got to go collect a bet. What bet? Asked Astro. With Tony Richards. But I thought you were afraid to bet on me. Not at all, Astro. I just wanted to make sure you were mad enough to ensure my winning. That sounds like you're more worried about your bet than you were about Astro passing, snapped Tom. You're exactly right, space boy, purred Roger, standing in the doorway. That's our boy Manning, growled Astro. A great team man. Team? Roger took a step back into the room. Don't make me laugh, Astro. For your information, tomorrow morning I'm putting in a transfer to another unit. What? exclaimed Tom. You can't transfer. Yes, I can, interrupted Roger. Read your academy regs. Anyone can request a transfer once the unit has passed its manuals. And what excuse are you going to use? snapped Astro bitterly. That you can't take it? A oh, personality difference, Astro, my boy. You hate me, I hate you. It's a good enough reason, I think. It's just as well, Hotshot. Because if you don't transfer, we will. Roger merely smiled, flipped his fingers to his forehead in an arrogant gesture of farewell, and turned to leave again. But his path was blocked by the sudden appearance of Captain Steve Strong. The three cadets quickly braced. The Solar Guard officer strode into the room, his face beaming. He looked at each of the boys, pride shining out of his eyes, and then brought his hand up and held it in salute. I just want to tell you boys one thing, he said solemnly. It's the highest compliment I can pay you, or anyone. He paused. All three of you are real spacemen. Tom and Astro couldn't repress smiles, but Roger's expression never changed. Then we passed as a unit, sir? Asked Tom eagerly. Not only passed, Corbett, Strong's voice boomed in the small room, but with honors. You're the top rockets of this Earthworm group. I'm proud to be your commanding officer. Again, Tom and Astro fought back smiles of happiness, and even Roger managed a small grin. This is the fightingest group of cadets I've ever seen, Strong continued. Frankly, I was a little worried about your ability to pull together, but the results in the manual showed that you have. You couldn't have made it without being a unit. Strong failed to notice Roger's face darken, and Tom and Astro looked at each other meaningfully. My congratulations for having solved the problems, too. Strong saluted them again and walked towards the door, where he paused. By the way, I want you to report to the Academy Spaceport tomorrow at 800 hours. Warrant Officer McKinney has something out there he wants to show you. Tom's eyes bugged out and he stepped forward. Sir, he gasped, scarcely able to get the question past his lips. You don't mean we're, we're going to... You're absolutely right, Corbett. There's a brand new rocket cruiser out there. Your ship. Your future classroom. You'll report to her in the blues of space cadets. And from now on, your unit identification is the name of your ship. The Rocket Cruiser Polaris. A second later, Strong had vanished down the corridor, leaving Tom and Astro hugging each other and clapping each other on the back in delirious joy. Roger merely stood to one side, a sarcastic smile on his face. 
And now we prepare to face the unknown dangers of space, he said bitingly. Let us unite our voices and sing the Academy hymn together. Huh, <laughs> he strode towards the door. Don't they ever get tired of waving that flag around here? Before Tom and Astro could reply, he had disappeared. The big Venusian shrugged his shoulders. I just don't understand that guy. But Tom failed to reply. He had turned towards the window and was staring out past the gleaming white tower of Galileo into the slowly darkening skies of the evening to the east. For a moment, the problems of Roger Manning and the unit were far away. He was thinking of the coming morning when he would dress in the blues of a space cadet for the first time and step into his own ship as command pilot. He was thinking of the morning when he would be a real spaceman. End of Chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Stand By for Mars This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sean O'Hara Stand By for Mars by Gary Rockwell Chapter 8 the campus of Space Academy was quiet that evening. Only a few cadets were still out on the quadrangle, lounging around in the open before returning to their quarters for bed check. On the 42nd floor of the dormitory building, two-thirds of the newly formed Polaris unit were in a heated argument. All right, all right, so the guy's brilliant, said Astro. But who can live with him? Not even himself. Maybe he is a little difficult, replied Tom. But somehow we've got to adjust to him. How about him adjusting to us? It is two against one. Astro shambled to the window and looked out moodily. Besides, he's putting in for a transfer and there's nothing we can do about it. Maybe you won't now. Not after that little speech Captain Strong made this afternoon. If he doesn't, then blast it, I will. Ah, now take it easy, Astro. Take it easy, nothing. Astro is building up a head of steam. Where is that space crawler right now? I don't know. He never came back. Wasn't even down at mess tonight. There, that's just what I mean. Astro turned to Tom and pressed his point. It's close to bed check and he isn't in quarters yet. If the MBs catch him outside after hours, the whole unit will be logged, and there goes our chance of blasting off tomorrow. But there's still time, Astro, replied Tom lamely. Not much there isn't. It just shows you what he thinks of the unit. He doesn't care. Astro paced the floor angrily. There's only one thing to do. He gets his transfer, or we do. Or, he paused and looked at Tom meaningfully, or I do. You're not thinking, Astro, argued Tom. How will that look on your record? Every time there's a trip in deep space, they yank out your files, see how you operate under pressure with other guys. When they see that you asked to be transferred from your unit, that's it. Yeah, yeah, I know. Incompatible. But honest, Tom. The curly-haired cadet felt his big friend weaken, and he pressed his advantage. It isn't every day that a unit gets a ship right after finishing ground manuals. Captain Strong said he waited four months after manuals before getting his first stop in space. Yeah, but what do you think it's going to be like in space with Manning making sour cracks all the time? Tom hesitated before answering his Venusian friend. He was fully aware that Roger was going to play a lone hand, and that they would never really have unity among them unless some drastic measure was taken. After all, Tom thought, some guys don't have good hearts or eyes, a defect to prevent them from becoming spacemen. Roger is just mixed up inside, and the handicap is just as real as if he had a physical flaw. Well, what do you want to do? asked Tom finally. Go see Captain Strong. Give it to him straight. Tell him we want to transfer. But tomorrow we blast off. We might not have another chance for months. Certainly not until we get a new Astrogator. I'd rather wait and have a guy on the radar bridge I know isn't going to pull something behind my back, said Astro, and blast off tomorrow with Manning aboard. Again, Tom hesitated. He knew what Astro was saying was the truth. Life so far at the Academy had been tough enough. But with mutual dependence and security even more important out in space, the danger of their constant friction was obvious. Okay, he relented. If that's the way you really want it, come on. We'll go see Captain Strong now. You go, said Astro. You know how I feel. Whatever you say goes for me too. Are you sure you want to do it, asked Tom. He knew what a request would mean. A black mark against Roger for being rejected by his unit mates. And a black mark against Astro and himself for not being able to adjust. Regardless of who was right and who was wrong, there would always be a mark on their records. Look, Tom, said Astro, if I thought it was only me, I'd keep my mouth shut. But you'd let Manning get away with murder, because you wouldn't want to be the one to get him into trouble. No, I wouldn't, said Tom. I think Roger would make a fine spaceman. He's certainly smart enough, and a good unit mate, if he'd only snap out of it. But I can't let him or anyone else stop me from becoming a spaceman or a member of the Solar Guard. Then we'll go see Captain Strong. Yes said Tom. If he had been in doubt before, now that he'd made the decision, he felt relieved. He slipped on his space boots, 
and stood up. The two boys looked at each other, each realizing the question in the other's mind. No, said Tom decisively. It's better for everyone, even Roger. He might find two other guys who will fit him better. He walked from the room. The halls were silent as he strode towards the slide stairs that would take him to the 19th floor and Captain Strong's quarters. Passing one room after another, he glanced in and saw other units studying, preparing for bed, or just sitting around talking. There weren't many units left. The tests had taken their tolls on the earthworms, but those that remained were solidly built. Already friendships had taken deep root. Tom found himself wishing he had become a member of another unit. For the comradeship was taken for granted in other units, he was about to make a request to solve his because of friction. Completely discouraged, Tom stepped onto the slide stairs and started down. As he left the dormitory floors, the noise of young cadet life was lost in the passing floors containing offices and apartments of the administration staff of the Solar Guard. As he drew level with the floor that was the Galaxy Hall, he glanced at the lighted plaque, and for the hundredth time he read the inscription, To the brave men who sacrificed their lives in the conquest of space, the Galaxy Hall is dedicated. Something moved in the darkness of the hall. Tom strained his eyes for a closer look and just managed to distinguish the figure of a cadet standing before the wreckage of the Space Queen. Funny, thought Tom. Why should anyone be wandering around the hall at this time of night? And then, as the floor slipped past, the figure turned slightly and was illuminated by the dim light that came from the slide stairs. Tom recognized the sharp features and close-cropped blonde hair of Roger Manning. Quickly changing over to the slide stairs going up, Tom slipped back to the hall floor and stepped off. Roger was still standing in front of the Space Queen. Tom started to speak, but stopped when he saw Roger take out a handkerchief and dab his eyes. The movements of the other boy were crystal clear to Tom. Roger was crying, standing in front of the Space Queen and crying. He kept watching as Roger put away the handkerchief, saluted sharply, and turned towards the slide stairs. Ducking behind a glass case that held the first spacesuit ever used, Tom held his breath as Roger passed him. He could hear Roger mumble, Got you, but they won't get me with any of that glory stuff. Tom waited, heart racing, trying to figure out what Roger meant, and why he was here all alone in Galaxy Hall. Finally, Blonde Cadet disappeared up the moving stair. Tom didn't go to see Captain Strong. Instead, he returned to his room. So quick? asked Astro. Tom shook his head. Where's Roger? he asked. In the shower. Astro gestured to the bathroom, where Tom could hear the sound of running water. What made you change your mind about seeing Captain Strong? asked Astro. I think we've misjudged Roger, Astro, said Tom slowly, and then related what he'd seen and heard. Well, blast my jets, exclaimed Astro when Tom finished. What's behind it, do you think? I don't know, Astro, but I'm convinced that any guy that'll visit Galaxy Hall by himself late at night and cry, well, he couldn't be entirely off base regardless of what he does. Astro studied his work-hardened palms. You want to keep it this way for a while, he asked. I mean, forget about talking to Captain Strong. Roger's the best astrogator and radar man in the academy, Astro. There's something bothering him. I'm willing to bet that whatever it is, Roger will work it out. And if we're really unit mates, then we won't sell him out now when he may need us the most. That's it then, said Astro. I'll kill him with kindness. Come on, let's turn in. We've got a big day ahead of us tomorrow. The two boys began to prepare for bed. Roger came out of the shower wearing pajamas. All excited, spacemen, he drawled, leaning against the wall, brushing his short hair. About as excited as we can get, Roger, smiled Tom. Yeah, you space blasting jerk, growled Astro good naturedly. Turn out the lights before I introduce you to my space boot. Roger eyed the two cadets quizzically, puzzled by the strange good humor of both boys. He shrugged his shoulders, flipped out the light, and crawled into bed. But if he could have seen the satisfied smile on Tom Corbett, Roger would have been more puzzled. We'll just kill him with kindness, thought Tom, and fell fast asleep. End of chapter eight.